What a beautiful song. What a beautiful opportunity to sing to our Savior. Would you be seated, please? Grab your Bibles. Find your way to Luke chapter 10. We're going to continue our series in Revelation next Sunday. But this Sunday, uh, we are challenging you to missional living. Uh, We're challenging you here through a sermon to missional living. And then we've tried to put the Great Commission out in the uh, the hallway so that you have to trip over it to leave. So that's our goal, that you can't get out of here without running in to the Great Commission. Now, for those of you who are joining us online, we want to encourage you to find these organizations that you can serve through missionally, and we will send out, uh, try to get an email out this week with all of those opportunities for you to serve. What we're challenging you to do is to find one place to serve missionally this year. Now, let me be clear uh, up front about what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to give to these organizations. Uh, Now, we already give to these organizations by your regular giving here, and we do some special offerings for some of the organizations that are represented here today, but we're asking you to find a hands-on way to serve. You know, as Southern Baptists, we're really good at giving to missions. We, that's kind of baked into our DNA. It's what we do. We give to missions. Uh, but I want you to understand that we cannot buy our way out of the Great Commission. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, go and make disciples, and then we, our response to, for our response to him to be, yeah, what kind of check have I got a right to get out of that? <laughs> that's not how it works. No, we're called to get in Involved with our hands and serve, and so you have some great opportunities for you, uh, for you and your family to do so outside. We're going to be in Luke chapter ten, thinking about missional living, where Jesus sends out seventy-two of his followers on what you might call a mission trip. And as I was thinking about this here in Luke chapter ten, I was thinking about the first mission trip, overseas mission trip that I ever took. I was the youth pastor at Union Number no. 3 Baptist Church in Ball Play, Alabama. Uh, I was 20 years old. Uh, my pastor, Larry, who you've heard me talk about over the last few weeks, he passed away from COVID just a few weeks ago, and so you've heard me mention him in several sermons. Uh, my pastor, he was kind of the older senior pastor. I was 20. Uh, he was the experienced guy. He was 29, and so he was that older experienced pastor that really helped me along the way. And uh, So we went together on a mission trip along with a few other people from our church to Venezuela, and it was an amazing trip. And, and here's what I recognized through the process of that trip. Uh, to go on that trip, you know, I had to change everything. I, was a, I wasn't making very much, just a part-time youth minister. I was in school. I had to work several other jobs in order to kind of make my life work at that point. So I had to schedule time off at all of those jobs. I had to save up a little money because I didn't work the kind of jobs that paid me when I wasn't there, if you know what I mean. And so I had to save up a little bit of money for that. I had to save up money towards the trip and had to prepare for the trip, had to brush up as much as I could on my Spanish, had to learn the material that we were going to share, had to learn how they were going to dress, how they asked us to dress. In fact, I remember in our training they said, people in Venezuela get offended if men wear shorts, and so even though it's going to be 110 degrees, you got to wear long pants. I said, hey, if that's what we got to do to reach the people of Venezuela with the gospel, then I'll wear long pants. So I packed nothing but long pants, not a pair of shorts in the entire suitcase, got over there, everybody was wearing shorts. They want to know, what is wrong with you? Why are you wearing long pants? I said, well, that part of our training failed us badly. Uh, But anyway, we adjusted everything. We adjusted everything because we had a short window, just 10 days. Get on a plane, go to Venezuela 10 days later, get on a plane and come back. And we wanted to share the gospel with as many people as we could. We wanted to be as efficient and effective as we possibly could, given that short amount of time that we had on that mission trip. Something hit me about halfway through that trip that has really changed the way that I've looked at my life ever since. If I'm willing to do this to reach the people of Venezuela, why am I not willing to do this to reach the people of America? To change everything that needs to be changed, to ask what does it take to reach people with the gospel, what are their spiritual needs, what, how do they need me to get to them? Where are they? How can I get there? What kind of sacrifice can I make personally to try to get the gospel to them? And so since that time, as much as possible, I have challenged myself to live my life as though I were living on a mission trip. And that's what I want to challenge you to do today. 
Uh, We have limited time. I don't know how long that time is, but our time here is limited. There are people here who need the gospel, and I want to challenge you to live your life as if it were a short-term mission trip because follower of Christ, that is, in fact, what your life is, a short-term mission trip that will someday come to an end. Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out 72 of his followers, just like I was sent out 20 years ago, just as I'm challenging you to be sent out here today. And the Bible says this, beginning in verse 1, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him. Stop right there for just a moment. We don't have time to unpack all of the context in the background of this. But I do just want to point out, uh, for because I think, it's in, I think it's important, that Jesus had already sent out the 12. So we typically think of the 12. And, and, and it might be that you're here today and you think, yeah, being sent out, that's kind of like what the, the professional guys do, the pastors do that, the youth pastors, maybe even the deacons do that, maybe even the life group leaders. But it's not normal Christians. See, Jesus sent out the 12, yes, but later he also sent out the 72. We don't have the names of the 72. We could guess at who some of them were, but we don't have the names of them because they were just 72 followers of Jesus. Here's the point. The point is, yes, Jesus sends out the pastors and the youth pastors and the life group leaders and the other leaders in the church, but Jesus also sends out every follower of Christ. It's just what Jesus does. He sends us out to live missionally. So Jesus has sent out the 12. Now he's sending out the 72. And the Bible says he sends them into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. What does it look like to live missionally? What does it look like to live missionally? Well, I've already said, just in a brief way, that living missionally means living your life like you're living on a short-term missions trip. I've given you a more uh, extensive definition there in your worship guide. It says this, living missionally is living every moment of every day pursuing the mission God has called us to, which is reaching the world for his glory through the authority of who Jesus is and the power of what Jesus has done, living missionally. We want to encourage you to live missionally. So what are some characteristics of living missionally? We have nine of them, so we'll have to move quickly through what it means to live missionally. First, we live missionally by being part of a faith family. You know, when I was first sent out on my first mission trip, I did it as a part of Union Number 3 Baptist Church in Ballplay, Alabama. That was my first international mission experience. And it's important to be sent out from a a church because that means you're a part of a local church who sees and affirms that yes God is calling you to do something like this and you're also supported by a local church the reason this is so important is because I see so many people who say like they're like lone ranger missionaries they're like you know what I work alone uh, leave me alone I- I'm going to be out here by myself and uh, and I don't have I don't need a church to live out my mission well you're exactly wrong you couldn't be any more wrong if you tried We have here in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sending out the 72. Who were those 72? They were followers of Jesus. These were people who had followed Jesus around, uh, who had learned from Jesus. They were a part of that early gathering. Perhaps they were part of those 500 people who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus 
after he was raised. We don't know exactly who they are, but they were a group of people who were following Jesus. In other words, they didn't come from nowhere. They were a part of a faith family. It was important for me to be a part of a faith family. It was important for them to be a part of a faith family. We have all the way from Matthew chapter 28, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 13. We have people continually being sent out on the mission God has called them to. But what we don't have is people being sent out who are not part of a local church family. So a local church family is important, being part of a faith family. That large faith family is what holds you accountable, helps you grow in your faith, it helps you take the next step in following Jesus. And then one of those steps along the way is to find somewhere where you can serve outside of the church and share the gospel in the name of Jesus. So a faith family is important. But that leads me to my second point. We live missionally by partnering with other followers of Christ. In other words, we can't just come to a church like this and say, well, I'm living missionally because I'm a part of the larger group. No, we get in smaller groups. This might be your life group. In fact, I would hope that maybe some of our life groups would find one of the tables out here and say, this is going to be our life group's project for the next year. We're going to serve together there. That might not work out for all of our life groups, but it'd be great if it did. But even if it doesn't, that's the place where you're held accountable on a local level. That's where if you don't show up for a couple of weeks or you schedule to serve somewhere together and everybody comes but you, that's the place that where they're going to say, hey, where were you? What's going on in your life? How can we get you plugged in? So if you're watching us online, I know this is even more difficult for you. That's why we encourage you to fill out those Connect cards. Get involved in the chat that's going on online. Post questions or responses in the Facebook feed. Engage with people so you can take your next step in getting more plugged into and finding someone to partner with as you pursue missional living. Jesus sent them out two by two. And with rare exception, everywhere in the New Testament that you find someone going out, you find them going out either in groups of two or larger. Rare is the moment when you find someone out sharing the gospel without someone with them. It's hard to think of Paul without thinking of Silas or Barnabas or Timothy. He always had someone with him when he was sharing the gospel. Uh, For me, we had a smaller group, a smaller team. There was Ronnie and Pastor Larry, as I've already mentioned, and Katie, that was our team. And then me, I made up the the fourth part of that team. And when we got to Venezuela, we split in two ways. And uh, Pastor Larry and and Katie, who was one of our students, and then Ronnie and I went in two different ways. And we went out and served, and we were partnered up with people from other churches. And we went out in different parts of Venezuela, but we served together. And I can tell you this, to this day, uh, I still have deep love and relationship with Ronnie. There are a few people on this planet that I have so much affection for uh, as I do for Ronnie because he and I were on that first mission trip together. We got the opportunity to go back and serve on another mission trip together. I got to see him a few weeks ago at uh, Larry's uh, celebration of life service and man it was just like uh, I would I you know we hadn't missed any time together and could have just spent a lot of time there with him. Why? Because we built those bonds together. This is where if you say well I have a hard time connecting at church. I have a hard time finding uh, good friendships at church. Serve together and you will build deep friendships together. We live missionally by partnering with other followers of Christ. Number three, we live missionally by recognizing the need. Notice that Jesus says to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You ever driven out in the country and of course in our part of the world at the right time of the year and seen those beautiful white cotton fields against a beautiful blue sky? Anybody ever seen that? And it's just one of the most beautiful things you can see. So as you're driving and you see these beautiful white cotton fields and they're filled with cotton. And it just makes you think, somebody's got to get that cotton. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He says in another place, the fields are white unto harvest. It's, It's full, it's ready to be picked. My grandmother, who's gone on to be with the Lord, I'll never forget, you know, going out across the country with her as a kid and seeing those beautiful white cotton fields and saying, man, that looks so beautiful. And my grandmother would say, that is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. (laughs) She hated cotton fields because when she was younger, she and her family picked cotton and she hated the look of a full cotton field. Uh, So, uh, but for most of us, we're able to see it and enjoy it the beauty of a cotton field. And we see it needs to be gathered. Well, that's what Jesus saw. We've got to see the need. If we're going to live missionally, we have to recognize the need. 
You know, we were encouraged as we prepared to go to Venezuela about the need in Venezuela. Yes, it's a country that claims a Catholic religion, but even those who claim a Catholic religion, they have very little connection to the church. They have very little understanding of the gospel. And it was a place, especially at the time 20 years ago, that was really ripe for the gospel. That was my experience in the city of Miami, too. I expected to move to Miami and find a cold city who didn't want to hear anything about Jesus, and no one wanted to hear about the gospel. But what I found was a town not that was over-evangelized, but that was under-evangelized. Uh, you would ask somebody, hey, uh, if you died tonight, where would you spend eternity? And instead of saying, hey, don't try to witness to me, they'd say, you know, it's a question I've never considered. <laughs> it's just never been asked. And so there was an openness to the gospel. And I used to say all the time, the only reason, humanly speaking, that more people aren't coming to Christ in the city of Miami is that there aren't more gospel-preaching churches open on Sundays. And I still believe that to be the case, that if you had more churches and more people preaching the gospel, more and more people would come to Christ in the city of Miami because there's such an openness. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We've got to recognize the need. But the need is not just in Venezuela, and the need is not just in Miami. The need is all around us. We live in a city where it is easy to be blind to the need because there are so many people who are followers of Christ or call themselves followers of Christ that we can live in a world where we are around only followers of Christ. And we can think, well, this whole city must be saved. This whole city must go to church somewhere. And we can miss an entirely different part of our city that is disconnected from Christ. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Go by the tables that are out here in our atrium and in our lobby area and ask them, do you have enough workers to do everything that God has called you to do or take advantage of all the opportunities God has set before you? And I will tell you to a person, they will tell you no. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We live missionally by recognizing the need. Number four, we live missionally by praying missionally. Now this is perhaps the most surprising part of this entire uh, passage. Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You would think what comes after that is, so get to work. Get out there and start harvesting. But see, Jesus' first response to this massive problem, this massive need, is not to work, but to pray. This is where I think we as a family of churches that we call the Southern Baptist Convention, this is where I think we have done a poor job. See, we're known, you might not realize this, but we're known as evangelistic people. Uh, Southern Baptists are known as evangelistic people. In fact, most, uh, most churches everywhere would say, well, if you want to know how to share your faith, then you need to talk to the Southern Baptists because they're good at sharing their faith. They have all kind of training for sharing their faith. A lot of our conventions, we get together and encourage and exhort one another to share our faith and share the gospel. But I believe we skip this part, this praying part. We think the power is in our going, and it is not. The power is in our praying. Do we need to go more? Yes. But I am convinced that nothing would do more to advance the cause of Christ in Mobile and around the world than a church that got serious about praying for lost people. Earnestly, he says, pray earnestly that the Lord would send more workers into his harvest field. If you got dropped off in one of those cotton fields and the next time you're driving out in the country and you see one of those cotton fields, I want you to imagine this cotton field as far as the eye can see. I want you to imagine that you got dropped off in the corner with a bucket and somebody said, now pick all the cotton. <laughs> you'd start to pray. You'd get, even if you weren't religious, you'd get religious real quickly. Lord, send somebody else to help me. How about a tractor? Could you get out here and get this cotton? I mean, there's too much work to do. Well, when we really recognize the, the need, one of the things that drives us to prayer is we realize there is not, there's not enough of us and there's not enough time for us to reach all of the people that could be reached if we shared the gospel and if there were more people sharing the gospel. So it drives us to prayer. We need to get serious about praying for lost people. I want to encourage you to change the way that you drive home today or change the way that you drive to the restaurant that you're going to. If you're going to our north campus over at Fusacles or if you're going to our south campus down at San Miguel's, whichever way you happen to be going today, would you change the way you drive, drive down a different road, drive a little slower, and just start praying, Lord, would you save the people at this house? God, would you send some somebody to share the gospel with the person at this house. Lord, would you send somebody to live on this street who would share the gospel with all the neighbors? God, would you send somebody to share the gospel here? We ought to pray 
missionally. You know, in preparation for that first mission trip 20 years ago, my pastor said, hey, we're going to pray. We were having a staff meeting. Uh, we had our staff meetings on the basketball court. Most frustrating thing ever, it was only he and I, it was only two staff. I was 20, he was 29, and I never beat him in a game of basketball. He had this shot that I just could not stop, and he would, he would get it every time. But, but anyway, we had our staff meetings on the basketball court. So one of our staff meetings, after playing a little while and working out what we're going to do at the church, he said, uh, he said I, I've got something the Lord's put on my heart. We've got this mission trip coming up. We're going to go to Venezuela. He said, I want to pray. Let's pray together that the Lord would save 3,000 people like the day of Pentecost. And you know, the first thing I thought, that's not going to happen. That's what I thought. And so, of course, I did it. I didn't say that, but I thought that. So I did it. I prayed because he's my pastor, and you're supposed to pray. And so I prayed, Lord, would you send, uh, would you save 3,000 people? But I didn't really believe God could do it. Well, he prayed this so often, and we prayed this together so often that when we went on the mission trip, we were divided out into different teams. There were about 130, 140 of us all together. And then when the mission trip was over, we all came back together and we gathered in one place to have a celebration service. And there was a little check-in desk when you walked into the hotel where we were having this service. And there was a lady there who was taking all the reports as teams came in. And they were sharing with her what had happened as they were out. And so I stood right there. In fact, I, Ronnie, Katie, Larry, y'all go in, save me a seat. I want to be right here because I want to hear how many people have come to Christ. And as the reports came in, 400, 500, 700, 800, 900. 900 people came to Christ. 900 people made a profession of faith. But I thought, you know what? That's not what we prayed for. And so all the reports were in and it was time to go in. But she hadn't calculated all the reports. And I thought, well, 900. We might get 1,000. We might get 1,200. Went in. There was a service. We had a little music. We had a little message. And then there came the time where we were going to celebrate what God had done for the week. And somebody stood up to, uh, to give the report. The report was not that 900 people had made a profession of faith. The report was not that 1,200 people had made a profession of faith that week. It wasn't even that 3,000 people had made a profession of faith. When the number was read, over 5,000 people made a profession of faith in that one mission trip. Praying missionally. You say, you think your prayer made a difference? No, because I wasn't praying in a way that, that I believed. But I think Pastor Larry's prayer made a difference because he believed. Wasn't the Lord going to save all those 5,000 people anyway? Look, you work out how God works when we pray and he answers and all that, and you let me know how that works. All I know is this. The Bible says that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective, and I saw a righteous man hit his knees every day and ask God to save 3,000 people. And God said, I'll do you that, and I'll raise you another 2,000. <laughs> That's what God did. So when we live missionally, we pray missionally. Number five, we live missionally by going where Jesus sends us. So Jesus says, pray, pray earnestly, and now go. Verse three, go your way. So pray that God's going to send out more laborers, but then go your way. So you go, and then listen to how he describes where we're going. He says, behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of of wolves. How many of you know Jesus never sends us to the easy places? <laughs> Lambs in the midst of wolves. If you grew up in church, you've probably heard that so much, you've lost the visual of it. But I want you to get the visual of a path lined with ravenous, hungry wolves. And I want you to picture a little sheep, no claws, no teeth, uh, no, no sharp teeth, now, it can't run, kind of waddles everywhere it goes, and it's just kind of waddling down this path, and on the left-hand side is ten wolves, and on the right-hand side are ten wolves. I want you to picture that sheep, because Jesus says, that's where I'm sending you. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. I can't really sign up. I mean, I can't sign up to be a part of, of this ministry or that ministry. That's dangerous work. Glad somebody does it, but surely... God would not call me to a place that is dangerous. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. If you were to read the book of Acts, you would wonder, does God ever call anybody to a place that's not dangerous? It's just the way it is. 
God calls people to dangerous places. He calls people to hard places. He doesn't call people to easy places. And he says, I'm, he doesn't hide it. He says, I'm sending you out there like sheep among wolves. That is the call we have been given. So the Lord might call you to be a part of our mission trip to New Orleans. It's going to happen Martin Luther King weekend. That's a family trip. So any age can go. You can go if you're single. You can go if you're a part of a family. You can bring the whole family, whatever you want to do. And you say, New Orleans. I've been to New Orleans. I don't know that I want to go there. The first time I went to New Orleans, I got so confused on the the set of one-way streets downtown that I thought I was going to lose my mind. And you know if you've been to New Orleans, you make a wrong turn in New Orleans and things can get real bad real fast. New Orleans is a dangerous place. Jesus would not want us to go to New Orleans. Yes, he would. Why? Because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Go your way. I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. See, here's the deal. A sheep's security is not in its claws or its teeth or its ability to run. A sheep's security is in its shepherd. You know, your security is not at home with the deadbolt locked and the security system on and the security cameras all functioning well. Your security is not in your concealed carry. Somebody said, Pastor, do you conceal carry when you preach? I don't. I do not conceal carry when I preach. There's nothing down in my shoe or anything like that. They said, well, you know, it's a dangerous world out there. I said, look, I'm the pastor of First Baptist Tillman's Corner. There is no need for me to conceal carry when I preach. All I got to do if something happens is hit the ground so I don't get caught in the crossfire. That's a, I'm good to go. <laughs> but our security, our security is not in our concealed carry. Our security is in our shepherd. He has a rod and he has a staff and he knows how to use them. And as we waddle down that path as sheep in the midst of wolves, our shepherd waddles behind us and there is not a wolf who will dare lay a claw on a single one of us because our shepherd walks in front of us, he walks behind us, he walks beside us and nothing can come to you unless it's sifted through the hand of your good and all-powerful and loving God. I think we have forgotten in the church that there is not a moment of our life that can be taken from us that is not determined according to God's will. Your date of death is already set, and it is not set by the enemy. It is set by your loving Father, and nothing can change that for one moment. What does it look like to live missionally? Number six, we live missionally by trusting the Lord to provide. You know, Jesus says, I want you to go out. And here he says, carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, greet no one on the road. Uh, He just says, look, I'm going to provide. Whatever house you go into, build the relationship there. And when you build a relationship there, then they'll provide the food for you. Eat what is set in front front of you. Any of you who have ever been on a mission trip know that can be pretty challenging. Uh, Two things. Uh, something that, that Ronnie, who was on our team, taught me is he carried a little, little bottle of Tabasco uh, hot sauce. And he told me, he said, Tabasco hot sauce will kill the flavor of anything. So you can just douse it in hot sauce and eat it. And he would give the, the families that we would visit. We would visit these families. They would cook things and put it before us. And for the most part, it was very good food. But he would give them this little speech. And he would say, uh, these peppers are grown on one island in Louisiana. This is a very special sauce in the United States of America. I've brought one here as a gift to your family, and I'd like to share it. He had a whole backpack full of hot sauce. And he kept giving these things away. And then he would just pull that hot sauce out and just douse the food and and eat away and uh, they thought uh, that he had given them the the most uh, desirable gift in all of the United States of America the way that he presented it by the way Ronnie's in sales for a living if you can't tell so uh, he uh, but we trusted the Lord to provide listen Jesus says I'm sending you out don't carry what you need I'm going to take care of what you need now that doesn't mean this everything in this passage is not every way we should do missions this doesn't mean that we can't prepare we can't carry money we can't carry food in this moment for them that was what God had called them to do but I do think we need to hear this again 
When you're called out to go on mission, don't think that all the T's are going to be crossed and all the I's are going to be dotted and all the money's already going to be in the bank and you're going to know where the vacation time's going to come from and you're going to know how you're going to pay for the trip and you know how everything's going to work out. Don't think it's going to work like that. In fact, if you want to know how to live missionally and trust the Lord is going to provide, get plugged in with one of these organizations out here because I can promise you there are a lot of Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays where they wake up not knowing if the money's going to last till Friday. It's just how it works. But you know what? If you want to see God do his work, some of you aren't sure God's even real anymore. Some of you haven't seen God work in your lives in decades. Say, I'm just not sure God's there anymore. You know why? It's because the battle is somewhere up there and you're way back on the back lines. And the Lord's with you. The Lord has not abandoned you. But you know where the Lord is at work? He's on the front lines. And if you want to see the Lord at work, then get on the front lines. And when you get on the front lines, you will say, had the Lord not provided, all would have been lost. And you'll see God come through in ways that you can't imagine. You'll see God do things where you'll say, only God. And God has a way of putting his signature on it. God has a way of saying, the the outside world would look in and say, oh, that was just a coincidence. And you will say to them, you weren't there. It was no coincidence. God put his signature on it. So God will provide, and we live missionally by trusting the Lord to provide. We're going to have some mission trip opportunities where we're going to be able to tell you where you're going to sleep, what you're going to eat, and what the bathroom situation is going to be. But listen, Tillman's Corner, as we step out to be a missional church, there are going to be some times where I'm just going to have to look you in the eye and say, I can't really tell you what we're going to eat. I have a decent idea of where we're going to sleep. I'm not really sure what the bathroom situation is going to be, but when we step off the plane, we will figure it out. But here's what I can tell you. They need Jesus. They've asked us to come be a part of this work, and we're going to go, and the Lord will provide. And I'm going to need you not to trust me, but if the Lord calls you and the Lord sends you, to trust the Lord. One of the most laughable things those of you who have been involved in mission trips know this one of the most laughable things is a mission trip schedule I've led many mission trips and I put those schedules together and I laugh as I put them together because I say I know this is not what we're actually going to do when we get there but you got to have something to put on paper so people can say oh yeah this is what we plan to do That's why flexibility is the name of the game, not just with the mission trip, but with these mission organizations. You may show up on a Tuesday morning to volunteer and think you're doing one thing, and they say, hey, we need you to jump in and do another thing. By the way, you're an answer to the prayer. We didn't know how we were going to get this done yesterday. We prayed God would send somebody, and guess what? It's you. Now we need you to take care of it. Pray, trusting the Lord will provide. Number seven, we live missionally by seeking out people who are ready to hear the gospel. This is one of the most difficult parts of this passage. And without going into uh, detail and, and, and pulling this passage apart bit by bit, if you have further questions about this, I would point you back to our Matthew series where we preached through this same commission that Jesus gave, and we did get into detail in some of these phrases. But it, it seems a little cruel that Jesus says, hey, if they won't listen, then dust your feet off and leave. And he says it's going to be harder for them on the day of judgment than it will be for the town of, Som- of Sodom. And that's all true. Uh, Those are all true statements. Those are statements of judgment against that town. But here's what I want you to see. Jesus said to his followers, your time is limited. You don't have time to waste on people who aren't willing to hear. Go to the people who will listen. How do you know who will listen? You tell them. When you tell someone and the door gets closed and the deadbolt gets turned, they put out the go away sign. Don't keep knocking on that door because there is another door who needs to hear the gospel. And you might go to five, six, seven, eight doors. And then the ninth door, somebody's ready to hear. Somewhere, somebody is ready to hear the gospel. Our job is to find that person. And and it's not that we can't invest time in people who are hardened. In fact, I would encourage you if you have friends or family members or somebody that you work regularly with that you reach out to and share the gospel with, keep sharing the gospel, keep coming back to them every once in a while, keep circling back because you never know when their heart is going to change. But if you get a closed door, move on to someone else because somebody is ready to hear the gospel. Keep 
moving until someone is ready to hear the gospel. And look, it seems a little crazy. It seems almost absurd to think that you might just chance upon somebody or happen upon somebody and say, you know what? You need to repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus. You need to make Jesus your Savior and Lord and turn everything over to him in your life and that they would say, okay, I'm in. But see, you don't understand how God works if that's your thought process. Because God sends the Holy Spirit ahead of you. He sends other people ahead of you. He's working in their lives. This is not a one and done thing. In fact, for followers of Christ, understand this. Evangelism is a rigged game. God works on their heart. He prepares their heart. He puts scriptures on their heart. He puts people in their path. And then you come along and you say, I want to share the gospel with you. Are you, are you ready to follow Christ? So many of the people that we share with in Venezuela, they were already ready. How could that be? Some people were praying for them. Many people have been praying for them for years, and we didn't even know it. And then God had already been working in their lives. Time after time, we would hear things like this. You know, I was praying about this just yesterday, asking that God would send somebody to help me understand what it really means to follow Jesus. You know, somebody brought a Bible a couple of weeks ago, and I've been reading the Bible, but I don't understand it. You know, I've been thinking about what it means uh, to, be, uh, to, to really love God, and, and I've wanted to know, but I know I'm not living right. And I was hoping somebody would come and tell me time after time after time we heard that story. I remember one man who many of the pastors had been to visit, and his wife was a Christian, but he was not a Christian. And so they said, well, will you go visit this guy? Yeah, we'll go visit that guy. And, and he wouldn't really listen to any of the other pastors. They'd been to visit so many times, he didn't really want to see them coming around because these strange guys wearing long pants from Alabama with this weird accent speaking English came. You know what? I'll, I'll at least entertain it. And I remember his wife just praying and praying and praying as we went to share the gospel with him. As we shared the gospel with that man, he said, yes, I, I'm ready to follow Jesus. And he said, well, maybe he was just telling you what you wanted to hear no, because here's what happened. That man prayed to receive Christ. He got up and he started walking away. And we thought he had misunderstood. We upset him, whatever. So where are you going? He said, I'm going to get my neighbor. They need to know Jesus too. Brought his neighbor back. And then he started telling them the gospel. And we kicked in and we were able to lead his neighbor to Christ. So that man was really changed for the glory of God. Was that because of us? No, it's a rigged game. God had already used dozens of people in that man's life, and that day was the day God was moving in his heart, and that day was the day he was ready to give his life to Jesus. We live missionally by seeking out people who are ready to hear. Number eight, we live missionally by serving those we are trying to reach. Jesus sent these 72 out and said, go and heal the sick Go heal the sick. P provide a service for them. And especially in the first century, think about it, with no medical care, uh, really very little access to anything that we would call medical care. These sick people that were suffering from all kinds of diseases that today are easily cured with an Advil or an antibiotic, all these people suffering from these diseases, for years and decades people would suffer. And Jesus said, you go out and heal the sick. Now, God might empower us, and we might see people healed from diseases. Certainly, God can heal anyone, and I've seen people healed. And if we had time, I would share you with you stories from the mission field and stories from here about people who were healed, and some of them even healed miraculously in, in a direct way. I've seen that happen. But that doesn't mean that every time we go out, we're going to heal the sick. This is their command, not our command. But it does, we do see a pattern in Scripture where Jesus himself and even his followers would meet needs, real needs, real physical needs, and then tie that with sharing the gospel. See, it's closely tied to the next point. We, make, we live missionally by preaching the gospel. Yes, we go out and serve, but we also preach the gospel. Here's what I want you to understand. There's not an organization here, nor will there ever be, under my watch, that doesn't share the gospel. They might do the greatest work in the world, but they're not going to be here asking you to be a part of their organization, and we're not going to give to them financially if they don't share the gospel some way, somehow. Because we can help in any way we want to help. We can meet all the physical needs we want to meet, but if we do not give them the gospel, we have left out the most important need. So yes, we help them physically, and many of the organizations that are here, you can get hands-on and help in a really tangible way, but we also must share the gospel. 
there's kind of a tendency to say, well, if we drop the gospel part, we can serve and help more people. There's a constant temptation for that. But we have to stand firm and say, no, we will share the gospel in what we do. We will not hide the cross. We will hide behind the cross. And if we're going to serve you, we're going to do so in the name of Jesus, the Jesus who was crucified, buried, and resurrected, and who today will forgive you of your sins and be your Savior and Lord if you will repent and follow him. We live missionally by preaching the gospel. For many of you, you say, well, you know, I try to live my life at work so that people know there's something different about me and that's good that's kind of that living missionally by serving those we're trying to reach and you ought to be at work by the way you ought to be the best employee you ought to be the one who turns in all your paperwork uh, on time if you can you know you ought to be the best employee you ought to serve those in your office when they're going through difficult times you need to be there you need to listen but at some point we have to open our mouths and share the gospel They will not understand the gospel message. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He was buried. He was raised again on the third day. And he is coming back to rule and reign. And he is going to take everyone who has submitted their lives to him to be a part of his eternal kingdom. They're not going to get that because you serve them and love them well. We have to open our mouths and we must share the gospel. We live missionally by preaching the gospel. Jesus commanded them, as you go out, heal the sick but also tell them the kingdom of God has come near. We live missionally by preaching the gospel. I'm going to come back to that idea in just a moment, but before we do, I want to tell you about one final story from my mission field experience in Venezuela. We, when we first went, we stayed with a man named Aldolfo. We stayed with him both trips. We were able to take two trips to Venezuela. We stayed, stayed with him both times, and Aldolfo was an interesting man. He spoke about as much English as we did Spanish, and so it made for an interesting relationship. We had no interpreter at night. You know, the interpreter would leave, so it was just us in the house, and we had a lot of great conversations, and I have no idea what he said, and he has no idea what we said, but we spent a lot of good time together. Uh, I know to his credit, he did not like Hugo Chavez, who had just been elected as president of Venezuela, and he had a machete, and he would walk around his yard, and he would say, Chavez, and he he did not like Chavez. (laughs) The first time I ever heard Hugo Chavez, it was Aldolfo was uh, plan- plotting to take out Hugo Chavez. Unfortunately, he was not successful. But here's the thing about Aldolfo. The last night to this day that I've spent in Venezuela, I laid my head down, went to sleep that night, woke up the next morning, and I had a dream. You're getting into signs and visions. Pastor, no, I'm just telling you what happened. I had a dream. We had talked with Aldolfo the night before. And because he didn't know English that well and we didn't know Spanish that well, over two trips, spent in total about 20 days with Aldolfo, we found out something the night before we did not know. Aldolfo was not a follower of Christ. He came to church with his wife just so he could be with his wife. But he didn't really believe. And we, we never really understood why, but something had happened earlier in his life that had turned him off to the gospel. And he was very frank with us through an interpreter. That's just not something I believe. And so we shared the gospel with him. It broke our heart that this man that we had come to have this relationship with didn't know the Lord. And we had shared and shared and shared. And he just said, you know what? It's not for me. Uh, It's not for me. So I woke up the next morning and uh, I had had a dream. And in my dream, Aldolfo had walked up to Ronnie and I. And he was doing all what he normally does in his very emotional way, trying to tell us something and getting our attention. And he kept pointing to his heart and pointing up to heaven, pointing up to his heart, pointing to heaven. And he'd get down on his knees. He'd get back up, and we couldn't understand in his dream. And I said, finally, we came to understand in our dream that last night he surrendered his life to Jesus. I told Ronnie that dream. I got up, and I went to take a shower, or um, more accurately, to get a bucket and dump it over my head. And uh, when I came back, he said, you're not going to believe what happened. So what happened? He said, 30 seconds after you walked out of this room, Aldolfo walked into this room, and he started going all crazy. And he started pointing up to heaven. He started pointing to his heart. And he got down on his knees in this room. And had you not told me what you just told me, I wouldn't have known what he was talking about. And I said, Ronnie, you misunderstood. There's no way. He said, I'm telling you, that's what happened. So the first thing we did is we got the translator. And we got the translator over to the house, and, and uh, we talked with Aldolfo. What happened? And he said, last night after I went to bed, I couldn't think about anything but what we had talked about. And the Lord started working on my heart. 
and I surrender to Jesus, and I am a follower of Christ, and I wanted you to, to be the first to know. You say, Pastor, I want to see stuff like that. Get on the front line. Get out there where you don't know how you're going to make it. You don't know how you're going to pay for the trip. You don't know how you're going to have the time. You don't know how it's all going to work out. But you feel a stirring in your heart to do it. Get out there and share the gospel. And you will see God work in ways where you will be able to sit across from those who don't believe that God exists. And you'll be able to, inside of your heart, laugh with a smile on your face and say, Yeah, you may not believe he's there, but I know he is there. Jesus sent them out with a message. The kingdom of God has come near. You know, I was thinking about the difference in Luke 10 and 2021. The kingdom of God has come near. What did Jesus mean by that? Go out and preach. The kingdom of God has come near. Remember, these were towns and villages that Jesus himself was going to go into soon. The kingdom of God has come near. Why was the kingdom of God near? Because the king was near. So the king was coming. He was coming into those villages and those towns and And so the kingdom of God was near. It was close by. And those who wanted to step from this kingdom to that kingdom, from whatever kingdom it was they were following here, could step into that kingdom. The kingdom of God has come near. Everything that God had promised he would do for his people, it's near, it's here. It's not only close in time, but it's actually physically close. And and so we think about the kingdom of God is near. What does it take to be a part of the kingdom of God? I'll tell you what it takes. It takes letting go of your allegiance to another kingdom. Whatever other kingdom is on your heart, whatever the throne of your heart, uh, whoever occupies and whatever occupies the throne of your heart, it takes getting that off and letting Jesus take his rightful place. And can you imagine this thought? Just think about the grace of this. The kingdom of God has come near and somebody else is seated on the throne of your heart, the throne that only belongs to God, and the kingdom of God has come near and God is not coming near in judgment and wrath. He's coming near in grace and mercy, saying, if you'll step off the throne, I'll forgive you. I'll step onto the throne, and you will live under all the benefits of the kingdom of God. That's what's being offered. The kingdom of God has come near. And you know, it would be sometime later that the door would be opened for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come near. Can we get into it? Sure, we can. Because the door was open when Jesus stretched out between heaven and earth, became the door. Jesus is the door. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to be a part of the kingdom of God? The only way to do it is through Jesus. Get off the throne of your heart. Give Jesus the throne of your heart. Recognize him as God for who he is, as Savior and Lord. Surrender your life to him, and you can be a part of the kingdom of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for sending us Jesus Thank you that the kingdom of God has come near. It came near 2,000 years ago, and it is still near today. Lord, it is near. Those who want to can step into it. Just one step, just stepping in and accepting what you've done for us, understanding and believing what you've done for us, surrendering, letting go, getting off the throne of our heart. Lord, I know there are those here who are sitting on the throne of their own heart, and if they'll just get off, Lord, you'll get on. Lord, I pray you would bring us to repentance and brokenness over taking your place in our lives and give you what's rightfully yours. I pray somebody would do that today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.